Welcome to the podcast of the Consortium for History of Science, Technology, and Medicine. I'm Bob Akish Rafi. Today is April 13th, 2020. The coronavirus epidemic has spread across the world and is hitting the United States especially hard. We're talking today with Nancy Tomes, who is Distinguished Professor at Stony Brook University. Nancy is a historian of medicine who studied the relationship between the knowledge of experts and popular understandings of health and medicine. Thank you for joining us, Nancy. Hi, it's a pleasure to be here, and thanks for doing this. Nancy, you have worked in this field for a long time. Could you share with us how your work in the history of medicine might help us to think about the current epidemic? Glad to do so. Let me start by saying it's a strange time to be a historian of medicine full of opportunity, but also some sadness, which I'll talk about at the end. In my over 40-year career, I've never been as relevant. The work that I've done has never been as relevant, and it's an unsettling experience. In the past couple of weeks, I get up every morning and there are emails from journalists in my inbox, some from as far away as Shanghai and New Delhi, suddenly interested in my patch of the history of medicine. They are keen to learn about the history of hand washing, mask wearing, and social distancing. And in the pursuit of that interest, they have found me. It may be that they Googled the, quote, germ theory of disease, end quote, and found a book I wrote a long time ago called The Gospel of Germs. Or they went looking for the Spanish flu in particular and found a 2010 article I did on that pandemic. My experience is by no means unique. I know my colleagues are also experiencing this sudden status as people of interest sought about in an unprecedented way. Why? Well, at one level, it's a natural response to a terrifying situation. People are scared and they're trying to make sense of what's happening and history helps them gain perspective. At another level, I'd say it's testimony to what I once flippantly termed quote, epidemic entertainments, end quote. That is, deadly diseases are part of our popular culture. And in a 24-7 news cycle, history becomes part of an obsession with the current pandemic broadcast across many different media platforms. It's not just TV and radio now, but social media as well. And of course, our old friends, print media. There are a lot of pages and a lot of minutes to fill as most of us are on lockdown in the United States at the moment. So history of medicine has become part of the info entertainment going on at the present moment. I have mixed feelings about that, which I'll get to at the end of my comments, but I'm ready to seize this teaching moment, and I have been willing to talk to everyone who has called me up. So what am I trying to communicate during this teaching moment? I mean, primarily I'm reflecting on the World War I pandemic because that's what I know the most about. But I also am focusing on that because it's such an important moment to show the relevance of historical research for contemporary policy planning as well as popular understandings of uh, pandemic. It's hard to believe, but back in 1986, Alfred Crosby described the World War I pandemic as America's forgotten pandemic. Well, it's forgotten no more. But the rediscovery of the World War I flu pandemic long predates the current crisis. It reflects a growing interest in pandemic preparedness that started first with concerns about emergent diseases in the 1990s after HIV AIDS, and then intensified after the bioterrorism attacks of 9-11. So studying the 1918-1919 pandemic has become a way to anticipate what folks jokingly used to call the next big one, the World War I equivalent pandemic in the 21st century. And, you know, the phrase big one, like the earthquake that supposedly is going to send California crashing into the Pacific Ocean. 
there has been a lot of talk about the big one coming and the way that the World War I influenza pandemic can be used as a tool of interdisciplinary research. And the phrase look back methodologies is now current in policy circles. And that's the idea that interdisciplinary analyses of past pandemics can help us identify which containment and mitigation strategies worked best in the past. Especially important in this reevaluation of the World War I influenza pandemic has been the work coming out of the University of Michigan. There's a critical 2007 article in JAMA written by Howard Markell, Martin Setron, and a range of other scholars that looked at the progress of the pandemic in 1918-1919 and the successful and not so successful use of so-called non-pharmaceutical interventions or they're now known by the easier to say term, social distancing measures. That work had a direct influence on the CDC's policy on pandemic preparedness. And out of this research came a wave of historical work about the pandemic, trying to use it for policy players. I was a very minor bit player in that enterprise. I worked with Howard Markell and Minna Stern as a team of historians. They made available to us a huge database of newspaper coverage of the World War I pandemic. And it was that material I used to write a 2010 piece that appeared in public health reports, not exactly a must read, but that 2010 paper has been rediscovered during the coronavirus and has led to a good number of the journalist calls to me. So what was that article about? The Michigan folks brought me in to talk about the popular aspects of the pandemic process. And since my work had primarily been about popularization of the germ theory and the kinds of everyday behaviors people were taught to avoid infectious diseases, my kind of assignment was to look at the bigger context of social distancing measures, which ones were accepted, which ones were not. So I spent a good amount of time reading newspaper accounts about the attempts on the part of public health departments to enact social distancing measures and what kind of pushback they got from uh, sometimes other public health officials, but also from local business owners and the ubiquitous public. So by the time of the 1918 pandemic, the playbook that we now work with in terms of how do you respond to a deadly viral disease that has no quick cure and no prevention, you have to try to contain its spread. And the playbook we're now using is strikingly similar to the one used during the World War I pandemic. So what you initially try to do is to identify and then isolate people you know have the deadly virus. That often proved difficult to do because people were contagious before you knew they were or you couldn't get them into isolation fast enough. So the second line of defense had to be to try to break the chain of infection by social distancing. So closing down public gatherings, school closures, and similar measures, essentially, to get people to stay at home. There's striking similarities with the World War I objectives and what we're trying to do today. Although I'm sure my fellow historians of medicine would want to critique this statement, and it bears critiquing, but let me just say, one might argue that the inappropriately named Spanish flu was, in fact, the first global pandemic to occur under what we might think of as so-called modern conditions. That means a high degree of industrialization, urbanization, and globalization. And this translating into an interconnected society. In the early 1900s, social scientists were beginning to use the word mass society to talk about mass transportation, mass media, mass consumption, even mass warfare. And that sense of an interconnectedness that really made disease control difficult was front and center in, in the response to 
the H1N1 pandemic in World War I. Despite a clear understanding that it was highly contagious, that it was probably a virus, and that the best way to control it was to isolate people, perfect isolation did not work. One of the comments I found in my study was a Massachusetts physician saying, you know, what we really needed to do was, quote, put each diseased person in a diver's suit and provide him with a pair of handcuffs. So this idea that you really needed to isolate the sick in order to stop the spread of the infection was clearly there. But this kind of so-called perfect isolation was impossible to implement in the face of the influenza as it had been for other epidemic diseases in this time period. So if you can't contain, then your next best goal is what we now call mitigation or slow it down, flatten the curve, as, as we talk about today. When I go back and read that article, I'm, I mean, I am overwhelmed by how contemporary some of the lines are. Public gathering bans exposed tensions about what constituted essential versus unessential activities. Yes, indeed. So I looked at the business community's response. I spent a lot of time reading Variety, the entertainment newspaper, to see how they felt about having movie houses and theaters close down. One of the interesting debates in New Orleans was about closing churches. My goodness. New Orleans closed churches, but not stores, and the clergy were quite upset about this. They said people need the solace of God during a pandemic. There was a lot of concern about too strict a uh, lockdown causing hysteria, that if you closed everything down, it would create morale problems, and that having high spirits was important to fighting off the influenza. Of course, they didn't have a sophisticated notion of immunology and the immune system in this time period, but they certainly had an idea that if you were distressed and discouraged, that the virus might find you an easier mark than someone in good spirits. So movie theater owners and theater owners said, we're essential to morale. You can't close us down. So there was a lot of very similar kind of debates about the costs, the mental costs, and also the economic costs for shutting down. After the pandemic was over, there was a lot of public health reflection on why it had been so hard to control. And the moral of the story was not about the failure of science or even of public health, but the difficulties of getting people in a mass society to stay at home and that the science was the least of the problems, that it was the social piece of that was really, really difficult to to manage. And that shows up in a lot of the reflections about the pandemic later. Literary Digest, July 1919. Influenza spread was simple to understand, but difficult to control. Certainly appropriate for us today. In 1922, an article in Survey magazine quoted an English newspaper, in fact, The Guardian, expressing the sense of futility in relation to influenza. And here's the quote. But of what use is it to advise a modern urban population to avoid traveling on trains or trams, to ask the rising generation to abandon the pictures or, or to warn the unemployed to take plenty of nourishing food and avoid worry. So the problems that we're seeing in terms of the pandemic hitting at people who don't have the resources to isolate or social distance themselves, much less even put food on the table, very clear in this pandemic as well. So as I sit here in my lockdown on Long Island in New York, which has been one of the hardest hit, there is an eerie sense of deja vu all over again, to quote my fellow New Yorker, Yogi Berra. Someone, I have no idea who this person is, sent me an email on Saturday with the tagline, yes, we still have a lot to learn. And when I clicked on the link, it was a link to that article that I had written in 2010. Yes, we still have a lot to learn. And it's important that historians be a part of that post-pandemic learning because 
basic science is not going to save us in this situation. What we, in fact, as a nation, had a reasonable pandemic preparedness plan, from what I, as a mere historian, can tell, a lot of thought had gone into that. We didn't enact it. And that's not a scientific problem. That's a political problem. So I think enlisting historians, other humanities scholars, I think here of the terrific work on disease narratives by people like Priscilla Wald, to really grapple with the complexity of this is going to take much more than inventing a proper vaccine for COVID-19 or coming up with the right combination of pharmaceuticals to slow its spread. Not terribly optimistic, that's going to happen. When we were working on this in the Michigan project, it was right when the 2009 so-called Mexican flu pandemic broke out. And it's not like we haven't seen the big one coming for a long time. And I'll just say, personally, it's very distressing. And this is the sad part to see how little we do seem to have learned from the past. This has been a podcast from the Consortium for History of Science, Technology, and Medicine. And I'm Jessica Linker, a program coordinator at the Consortium. You can find other podcasts, video lectures, archival spotlights, as well as opportunities to connect to our community of scholars at chstm.org. This podcast is made possible with the generous support of the Pew Charitable Trusts, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, and the Rita Allen Foundation.